welcome. Um, this is the Faith to Faithless Conversations. Um, my name is Audrey Simmons and I'm a volunteer for um, Faith to Faithless. Today we're in conversation with Jim Scott. Jim Scott is a um, work, works in Northern Ireland. Um, he set up a support um, for people who are leaving religion. Um, leaving not just religion, but leaving challenging religions and mm. those conservative religions um, where mm -hmm. there can be issues with people um, leaving. So Jim has been uh, a contributor to the development of the Faith to Faithless Dialogue training. Um, he is um, also talking to us today about his incredible journey from being a from being a non-believer to be being a humanist and like all good stories they have a, a beginning a middle and an end so the end i suppose is that jim you are a humanist but yeah. i suppose you know let's start with the beginning how did jim scott become a humanist well um well, well i was a christian um and not just a run-of-the-mill christian charismatic evangelical uh christian the kind that um, I'll use the word extreme. Um, I think in the context of modern society, extreme, if we just look, turn on our television set, we can see extreme. Um, so people may think, well, you know, he was a nice guy. I mean, on all intents and purposes, I ran the new converts class. I preached. I married people. I buried people. I baptized them. Um, to all intents and purposes, I was a normal church leader. Uh, However, the extreme part of it is probably looking back is from what I believed. I was a young earth creationist. The Bible was literally true. It was un uh, inerrant in every way. Um, so you sitting there as a, as, a, as a fellow humanist can automatically see where that flags up now. Um, whenever you believe in something that is uh, fundamentally, dogmatically, totally and absolutely without error. Um, and then bringing people on, uh, as we would, would have said, uh, into the church. Um, as I say, I, I would have taught the new converts. Um, I was also, I headed up their um, devotional, um, uh, the devotional Bible college within my denomination, set that up, and was the dean of it for many years. Uh, so I was very much at the start, even from the, from the first few months as a Christian, um, I got very involved. Um, my wife would joke and say I was the, the only joiner she knew who never touched a piece of wood because anything I joined or got involved with, I had to be in fully immersed in it, had to be at the center of it and, and had to be leading it um, and had to be committing to it 100%. And Christianity, that version, the charismatic denomination that I was in, allowed me to get immersed 100%, 110%, if you could say it. Um, and then because believing the Bible so strongly, now I came to faith, as we'll call it, when I was uh, in my 30s, my early 30s. So I'm now in my 50s. I know I don't like it. but Not at all. Uh, so I'm in my 50s now. So I came to it and I already had a good bit of life. So I don't have an excuse that I was indoctrinated as a child. I had already a good lot of life experience. I left the military, I came home and I, I had problems with alcohol. Now that's, we'll not get into that, but it is, it does bear on this because when you, you leave one support system, which was the military and come back home, and you've had to separate from friends and um, contacts because you don't want to live that kind of life anymore because of the, the alcohol dependency. I, I had to leave that. And Christianity, well, the, whenever I first met the people that I ended up being involved with, it gave me that sense of belonging. It gave me that, that connection that I was missing. And more importantly, it gave me a truth. And when someone says to you, believe this, it is beyond doubt the absolute truth because God Almighty says so. No, it don't, doesn't matter which faith background you come from. That's very reassuring uh, in, in the sense that you, you've been given, you, someone saying to you, this is absolutely true. Uh, and you don't have to think beyond it. 
that was very comforting. And it was comforting for about 15, well, about 15 or so years. It was very comforting to me. And any doubts that I had, I quickly quashed them and I was able to move on. So really just to, just to kind of recap that, um, I spent 20 years, most of it in leadership, most of it um, helping to um, create more Christians into my particular denomination. And any sense of free thought that might have came into my, my mind, I used the dogmatic doctrine of that particular, particular church um, to quash it because I believed what I've been taught was the absolute truth which you can see the problems with. <laughs> you know the problems, and I think that is a thing. I think it's what's interesting is that you needed support. You mm -hmm. needed, and, other, and and you were coming out of a difficult situation. So what we yeah. have is someone who's vulnerable and open to suggestion, yeah. open to that kind of, um, I mean, I'm supposing that space, you could have been filled with anything. If you'd met someone else, that space could have been filled with, with very much anything, anything because mm -hmm. that's what you were looking for. But it just so happens that it happened to be Christianity. And I think for you at that time, that is, you know, it was a perfectly reasonable way. Mm -hmm. And I suppose our society is created in a way that religion is okay. You weren't going into a cult, you weren't going into anything, you know what I mean? No. That was society deems this okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you were doing is perfectly legitimate. And I think, you know, what I mean, we tend to kind of beat ourselves up for things like that, but there is no need to. And I think for a person in your situation and, and for, for the way that you were thinking at the time, it's a perfectly reasonable way to be to think and to behave. So you're part of this church, you're part of of it you're, you're you're immersed in this so you're going yeah. up were you were you a door knocker were you on the door were, what how were you manifesting yourself as a christian um again i, th I think having having had that um previous experience uh, as i've said um through, through the, the british army and having 10 years of that i i was quite militant in how i approached um getting people in church. I saw this as the answer to everyone's problems. So whenever you're that committed, you've been sold that message. We, we talk about, I'll give you an example. Um, people in the church were referred to as the body. Uh, they're referred to as the, you know, you're in fellowship. And they've got words like um, you're part of the God's family. So you feel you're part of something. But anything outside of that is, we would have classed that as the world. The person is in the world. So that automatic drew a disconnect between us and the world. It's a very subtle language, but once you think about it, it can be, and it can be. And look, I, I know there are, there are some um, people, there are some um, religious organizations and institutions that do tremendous work and don't um, uh, seek to be insidious in their nature. And I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking specifically about my the group that I was involved with. And that sort of subtle language can make you think that, well, I have to save people from the world, from, from the life that they are in. So whenever you have that idea that you are bringing them the antidote to their problems, and we used to say, Jesus is the answer, what's the problem? Or whenever you've got that sort of pre, um, whenever you're very formulated the answer for everyone, um, then it's easy to go out and be a, an, a, an avid um, door knocker. Um, I would stop people in, in um, shopping centers and, and prophesy to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I would pray, ask to pray for them, speak in tongues to them. Oh, this is in public. Mm. Uh, irrespective of how embarrassing it was for that person, because I was doing God's work. Uh, I went on a missions trip to Russia several times and I remember stopped just we would have went out into public parks in Russia with an interpreter and stopped people and prayed with them and offered to heal things and heal their ailments or or babble away in tongues um, and all those sorts of things and again that behavior in itself if it's in the confines of a church doesn't seem that out of place but when you take it into the public arena it can't be a, a spectacle. <laughs> mm. uh, and, but I believed it. 
And I was 100% convinced of it. And not only that, I taught others to do it. So I, I not only was it, what was I part of, um, part of the church, I was also an instrument of the church, helping create other converts. You were talking about Russia. How were you received? I mean, in communism, um, was communism still there? Was this after the communi after, after uh, communism had fallen? How, when was this? This would have been after. Mm. This would have been um, early, early noughties, um, mm. which, you know, is a good bit after. They, they, had, they had had their charismatic revival. They had had, as, as it's called, they had had an influx of Western church. As well as they had an influx of Western culture, they would have had an influx of the Western religions that had come in. Um, and they had also left and come out. And one of the, the a pastor that we had connected up with, and he ran a ministry that traveled all around Russia, um, teaching an inductive Bible study method. And my uh, senior pastor of our church met him we got connected and we ended up, he ended up going out for a missions trip and then eventually we brought a team out. So I'm, I think I went um, four, five, five times. Um, but we received, we were received with mild curiosity, maybe in, so, in some of the older folks. I remember talking to an, an old communist and his wife in a, in a park in, in, a, in a town out there um, through an interpreter and he, he wanted communism back but that, I, I sort of thought again after that and I'm thinking now he wasn't unlike me in the sense that I wanted this sense of order this sense of predictability in life um, my truth was the gospel his truth was communism you, you know I'm not trying to say that communism and the gospel are the same thing but in our minds you know they, they gave us that comfort and he was now, him and his wife were now exposed to a society that seemed uh, a bit disjointed, unorganized. There might have been things under communism that weren't nice and under that regime that weren't nice or weren't good or, or were even worse. I'm probably being um, diplomatic with my language, but he still craved that. So, so look, I, could, I could find a connection with, with anyone. And I think that that, again, was the... <clears throat> that was the thing that, that you were taught, be all things to all men, so you might win some. So I think what, what, it, what it taught me as well was to find common ground. Now, that isn't a bad thing. Absolutely. But, com but common ground when you have an agenda, you know, can, can, can sometimes be unhealthy. Absolutely. And it is, I suppose that's the kind of thing that we talk about as humanists. We talk about the mm. idea that the, the church can be coercive, manipulative, and we do recognize the, mm. the good, the community spirit, the mm. kind of support networks that are part of, of, of religion. But there is this idea that, you know, there is this other side to it. And I think sometimes, you know, we do have to talk about it in mm. context, you know yeah. what I mean? It isn't about labeling everyone, but you're talking about something very specific. You're talking about that charismatic church, that kind of the kind of conservative thing, that kind of thing where it's 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 a bit more. There's a bit more pressure. Did you feel pressured? Yeah, um, and <clears throat> I think if we if I had someone else here with me who had been on that journey with me, um, and there at the time, I would have thought. Well, no, there wasn't really any pressure. No one specifically said, you know, you must do this and you must do that. But it is always inferred. And I'll, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> we practice tithing, which is a, it's an, an Old Testament thing, but it's where you give a tenth of your income. Absolutely. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, so I understand it perfectly. <laughs> tithing. So there was a debate. Well, whenever you first come into a church, you tithed and you gave a tenth of your income. But there was a debate about whether that should be before or after tax. And how it was sold was, well, if you're not 10%, how can you be 100%? Oh. If you can't be 10%, how can you, for God, how can you be 100% for God? So there, it was almost inferred that you have to, and it, not, not too subtly, but then also on the back of that, there was then a, a separate conversation was joined on that 
Those who move forward in leadership give, will tithe. Those who don't will not. So for someone who is feeling the pressure to be all they can for God, there's always that, that need to do. So I tithed the whole time I was there, 10% before tax. So even though the tax man might have took money off me, I didn't rob God. And again, that's another thing. If you don't give your tithe, you're stealing from God. Um, I always kind of afterwards had impression that God was had money issues. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't manage his money. Yeah, he, no, he's got serious, money. Yeah. Money issues. But, <laughs> No, uh, and again, but on a serious note, you, that that is one way where it was that where it hit people right in the pocket, literally. Other ways were that um, the, the the number of meetings and stuff you might have went to. Um, if, if you missed a meeting, if I missed a meeting in church or missed a meeting on Wednesday night, didn't see you. Where were you? What was going on? What was happening with you? Did you go to church oh, often? Was it an everyday thing? How was how did that? Work? It would have been at, at minimum two services a week a saturday a sunday on a, on a wednesday minimum but i might have i could have been out anything up to six uh, days a week doing something and even when you're not out doing it i would have been preparing sermons uh, preparing things to teach through the college uh, dealing with different groups that i was involved with um, so i would have headed up um, the front of house services like like ushers and welcomers and and stuff like that, or involved in other projects, or the missions work we did, I trained the, the, our, our, our missionary folk. So there was always something to be doing. And if you weren't doing that, then it was your own devotional time. You were, you were, you were praying, you were reading. And it, it all was, again, it's, it, it almost felt like it wasn't enough, that I wasn't doing enough, um, because there was always work to be done. And, and our church grew, the church I was part of grew from 30 people when I joined it to 300 when I left it. Wow. Um, so we did a lot of hard work to grow it. And it went from a small hall, um, a, an old, um, they have Orange Institution over here. Okay. You see the guys yes. praying. Yeah. We would have met in one of their halls. Just um, not part of that organization, but would have just met in it mm -hmm. um, when they weren't using it. But we went from that old hall to a buying a, an, a, a, an industrial estate and putting the church in the middle with um, you know 800 seater auditorium and, and all the, the bits and pieces. So it was very modern looking in its outlook. You know, it had nearly a hundred stage lights. It had a massive 20 foot front screen. It had an um, a, an auditorium style thing. It was geared up um, for media and for technology and for and if you go on youtube you can see the church there where there are several meetings a week so but but there was always that growth idea and there was always we have to do more we have to grow the kingdom and growing the kingdom was making the church bigger and growing, bringing more people in so yes um, you did feel pressure to always do that and and anything that that didn't do that if you didn't perhaps attend all the meetings or if you didn't tithe or give or if you weren't there vocally or, or doing the work, you were kind of pushed to the side. And, so um, there was shunning? Is that, was, would it, was it safe to say well, there was shunning? Yeah, well, shunning was probably more to someone who transgressed by leaving. You wouldn't have been shunned actually while you were still in there. There just would, you would have just been, you wouldn't have been noticed or recognized or made a fuss of. Um, we had a, how we would have brought people in in the first sort of three or four weeks there was nothing like you my ushering team were trained that with the 11 second rule we called it so when someone walked in the front door you closed that distance you greeted them within 10 or 11 seconds with a smile you welcomed them um you uh, introduced them to p other people you would have brought, we had a coffee bar set up in the foyer with all comfortable seating and it was all very relaxed. Um, we, and then other people that I trained, so whenever someone did their new beginnings course or their new starts course, we put them through a training course to, to train them on how to behave in church, which again is another. When I look back, it's a bit 
controlling. Um, it's a and, that came into uh, my head. <laughs> you know, I know. And we would have got told them that your job now, once you've done that, is to go and greet others. So within that first, you know, 10 minutes before church, they might have spoke to 30 people. You know, 10, 20 to 30 people would have came over to them and smiling and, and greeting and, and, and being chatty. And this just wouldn't have been any old people. A lot of them would have been young, young well, couples maybe, or young women and maybe 20 to 30 year old, not just old men chatting with them, but people who were very relatable and, and offering them a coffee and introducing them to their kids and talking to them about everything but God and giving them that sense of belonging. And sometimes when you come in there and you're a bit frazzled, you've got along there, you've got your wife with you, your husband with you, you've got your children perhaps with you, or maybe you live on your own, or maybe you're having difficulty in a relationship and you come into that environment and you're immediately automatically accepted. It, it, it's, it's very addictive um, personal uh, position to be in. You just feel like you're really part of it. But after a while, um, a few weeks, you stop getting that as just as much attention. And then we, we'll say to you, and I, I don't, that wasn't on purpose. That was just because you're looking on to the next person. But we, what we used to say was connect someone in, get them joined in, and then they'll stay. So we would have tried to make a connection with a like family or a like person to get, to get them connected and then get them onto a partnership course, which automatically got them tithing and paying into the church. So they felt part of the church. So you, there was a pathway, a very clear pathway from being outside in the crowd, as we called the world, in the crowd, to being in the congregation, to being committed. And we brought people through that very, very quickly, very subtly, but very focused um, and, and into an area where they were committed to stay in the church. So, yeah. Wow, it sounds, you've got a whole strategy. There's a kind of book there. We can kind of adopt some of the, the kind of things. Oh, it I was mean, a strategy. Yeah, a complete strategy. That's that's amazing. So here we are, you are in it. You're there, you're doing it every day. You've got your six, your seven days a week. Mm -hmm. When did the doubt leave? Um, probably, probably I think about, I, I was about 10 or 12 years and I can't be specific of when it was an actual time, but I know the event and the event was the, the, um, the leader of the church. Um, we were discussing healing because our church believed in spiritual healing. We Did believe you heal? Did you heal? Yeah, I would have been one of the ones who would have laid hands on people. And I had people who said, yes, I have been healed by you. Now, I, looking back on that, I can give you reasons why that was, and perhaps we'll touch on that. But at the time, um, I, I became very bold because that's how you were told to be. Not bold as in bad, but bold as in forward, brave. Um, the person who could get in there and offer prayer and offer to heal someone um, was seen to be the one who was listening to the voice of God. And I, as I say, I would have prophesied, I would have laid on hands. Um, uh, I would have been part of that ministry tape. And I actually taught people how to do that. So yes, I would have. Um, so, yeah. So how did that make you feel? If you, you know, there you are, you're laying on hands and someone comes to you and said, you healed me. How does that make you feel? Um, I think I think the, the, the human part of you feels pretty euphoric. Um, you feel you do, and, and, and as I say, it is it, it's it's quite quite addictive. Um, and it, well, to me, and maybe it led that was because of my addictive personality that led me to abuse alcohol. Um, but I, I did find that it it was quite addictive. I, I can liken it to it's a really terrible analogy, but it's the one that's just come into my head. Uh, <laughs> If you, if you imagine a, a World War II um, fighter, you know, and he's just, every, for every plane he shoots down, he gets a little swastika on the side of his, on his yes. aircraft for every yes. one he shoots down. You know, um, we used to actually talk about another leader from another church over here, a very big church over here with thousands of people in it. And he would have wrote the names of everyone he led to the Lord into his Bible. But again, to me, that's more like notches on your gun belt, if you know what I mean. It's it just seems like, you know, you know, it's it's all about the, uh, it's it's all about you, um, 
getting someone healed rather than the person being healed. Um, that's how it felt. Now, and don't get me wrong, not everybody takes it from that, such a, that approach, but it did feel very much like that. And, and it felt to be all about how good you could be for God rather than how much you could heal someone else. And as I said to you, how, how it actually changed, and you asked the question, at what point did these things start to doubt slip in? Well, I remember speaking with a, a senior leader from the congregation I was in um, about someone not being healed. And he said that if someone isn't healed, um, God isn't broken. And I said, so if God isn't broken and God never fails and God always heals, then why is that person not healed? And, and I'm not a novice. I'd been there for 10 years. I had been involved in the healing practice. Uh, why is that person not healed? Well, if God's not broken, then it must be them. So they're lacking enough faith to be healed. So that, all, that resonated with something in the back of my mind that, well, that, that condemns that person because if they don't have enough faith to get healed and faith is a gift from God, then God mustn't like them very much. One, he hasn't given them enough faith and two, he's not healing them anyway. Uh, and that sort of, that little seed got planted, got planted in my mind. Um, and, but when things like that got planted, that was doubt. And what you did with doubt was you prayed harder, you worked harder, and you pushed that doubt down. You pushed it away and you pushed on. Uh, and you never let those thoughts settle. But it never truly went away. And it, it sort of was the, the first time I remember thinking, wow, this really... It could be something wrong with what I'm doing. So where did you take it from there? You're, you've got the seed. How did it grow? How did it change? I, th I think, I think uh, um, as I said, you, you, you want to keep pushing that away. So I started to think in me, not, not that I had a handle on some truth. I started to think that, wow, I'm not a very good Christian. I'm not very good at what I'm doing. I'm doubting. Um, you know, again, another thing that mentioned a character in the Bible says, I believe, help my unbelief. And I would have constantly prayed that. I would have constantly said, look, look I really believe this, um, but there's doubt creeping in. Help me deal with the doubt. Excuse me, I thought it was a defect in me. I thought that God was testing me about something. So I went straight back to the, the belief that there was something wrong with me. Um, so I constantly fought through that. I'm still leading. I'm still teaching. I'm preaching from the front of the church. The congregation's getting bigger. Um, you know, there's probably still videos and DVDs of me lying around the place and, and, and hopefully nothing online of me preaching. Uh, so all those things are still going on. So I'm very much a face. I'm going on mission trips. I'm, I'm part of the, the, the leadership team of the church. There are four or five people. And when they walk into church, go, who leads this church? I'm one of the ones they point at. But in me, there's this doubt growing. So I'm feeling, yeah, I'm this super, super Christian, but really inside, I'm awful. And God really probably doesn't like me very much. So there's this ten tension building. It just made you feel awful, though, to think that the God that you are worshipping, the God that you have devoted your life to, your time, energy, everything, and that mm. still a part of you thinks that he doesn't like you. That, that no. must have been devastating for you. Yeah, but as I say, this, this started growing, growing, to the point where probably about six or seven years, well, about six years ago, seven years ago it was, my timing's right, um, I decided that, it was probably the denomination that I was in that I needed a more strict environment. I need something that was more rigid. I had, I had, I still had my doubts about healing and whether or not the gifts of the spirit, as I call them, were for today, whether there was prophecy, whether God, I believe God spoke directly into my brain. In fact, I believe he spoke directly into my heart. And we were told to turn off our brains because our brain got in the way got of our heart. Mm. It got in the way. So logic and reason got in the way of what God wanted to do. Another flag. So 
and and I believe God spoke directly to my heart, and I should listen to that over and above any other evidence that I saw with my eyes or heard with my ears. Um, but those things, I started to think, maybe that's the problem. Maybe I need to take my Christianity to a more strict Bible-based level. So um, I decided to leave that denomination, um, which was massive. I had people weeping in front of me as I was in the foyer. Don't go. Weeping. Women crying. Um, and the people shocked and people later on on social media likening it to a death in their family. And why did that, why was I leaving and deserting them? And people banging in on the leader's door. Why is Jim going? What's wrong? What's happened? What's he done? Uh, what's he done? And all this sort of stuff going on. But I went to another denomination that was a bit more, it was more conservative. It was more extreme in that respect, but it didn't practice any of the gifts. But it also was very dry. Um, it wasn't the happy, clappy, dancing. Joy. Because yeah. we had a massive worship team, 17 in our worship band with guitars and drums. And it was very, very lively. When you walked in, after being the foyer and were hit by the wall of sound of the worship band, it, it was something else. It was a concert. And, and that thing when you come in on a drudgery of a Sunday morning or Wednesday night, it just lifted you. And, and it, I, it, my thoughts of it now, it's still, I would get a lift out of thinking about it because it was, it was, it was fantastic in that respect. It was well crafted and put together. It didn't happen by accident. So, and we spent a lot of money doing that. So when I went to the other denomination, I just found that that's not right. This isn't for me. So I left after a few months and went back. Uh, and going back, that's when things changed, really changed for me. But now you're a humanist. So how does that, how did, did that change happen? And are you still friends with people from, from no. either of those churches? How no. are they treating you? What's happening? Actually, I met um, a person last night. Uh, very recently, I was in a shop with my daughter and I noticed when well, we all have our masks on nowadays, but I, I noticed um, this woman um, and I looked and I re recognized her. She was the wife of a, of a leader of the church that I went to when I left the one I was in. And she just blanked me. She just looked at me and looked away. And I was says hello. And she ignored me and she walked on. Um, and that, that, that's, the, that's the, the shallow end of the shunning pool. It gets deeper. Um, from my old congregation after going back, you know, I was immediately put on to what is called discipline. In other words, you, you, you kind of went away. We're not sure where you sit. We're, we're not going to let you preach. We're not going to let you serve. You can come and sit. You can be part. You know, we'll, we'll love you. But um, you need to sort of take time out. And, and that kind of grew. And eventually I saw more and more of the chinks in what was wrong with it. To the point where I one day left a meeting, went down and bought a copy of The God Delusion by, uh, by, by Richard Dawkins, only because that book was demonized within my brand of Christianity that you know, Richard Dawkins was all the devil. Literally, that's how they... So I went back and I told my leader I was leaving and he, um, after three hours, kept me talking to me and wanting to pray with me and tell me how great I was and tell me how bad I was. And it was sort of like good cop, bad cop. And, and then he, at the end, he said, well, I, just wait there. I'll get some of the other guys and we'll cast the demons out of you. Gosh. And I just said, I, I just said, no, I'll keep my demons. Thanks. <laughs> They're mine. <laughs> and, and I left and that was it. And that really brought me down to earth. But after reading Dawkins, I realized that, well, there were, and, a, and a, it, it was a real culture shock. I read it twice. I would have preferred my wife, I actually hid it from my wife, the book, I would have preferred her to catch me with pornography or something. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was really embarrassing. Um, and, then, and then I actually showed her the book and I said, look, I've read this and she cried. And my wife is still a believer. Now she's a Christian with a small C now, but she's still a believer, which is another thing. But yeah, what, 
but the good thing was after I read that, I read other books and I started to read other things and I started to read things like Big Bertrand Russell and, and um, Sam Harris and a whole mix of people. Then someone gave me a book, a little, a little book of humanism or something. It was something that, no, or, and I read it and I thought, well, that's me. I, I, I must be a humanist. So I thought about, we thought, well, this, um, this must be a, like a religion. <laughs> so so I, had that. To go that. I had to yeah. go through that whole circ thing and, and working out that, you know, look, it's not, you know, it doesn't have the dogma. It's not resistant to change. It's not resistant to new ideas. It's not resistant to people. Whereas my faith was resistant to change. It, it made me resistant to people. If you weren't my, from my eth ethnic background, if you weren't, um, straight, if you were gay, if, if you um, wanted to have premarital sex or live with your boyfriend or girlfriend, if you want to do all those things, then God didn't like that. And God wasn't happy with you. And I wasn't happy with you. But that my, the, the scales literally fell off my eyes, to use another biblical phrase. And I realized, wow, isn't it so much better to be a free thinker? Isn't it so much better just to take people as who they are, as, they, as you find them, and try and find that common ground that, that I did when I was in Christianity, but I was using it as an ulterior motive to get them saved, whereas now I just do it to get to know people, you know, to understand how they do life and see life. And life is about that. It's about just working out yeah. how we're going to live together in this mm -hmm. time and, you know, Jim, I want to thank you for your story, for taking the time to share the story of, of your life. And I think it's really, it shows the path that people take and that it's not always an easy one. And, mm -hmm. you know, to be shunned, to not be talking to people who were very much a part of your life, that's difficult. And you're sitting here now with that big smile on your face and, and you know, <laughs> being, being a part of humanism. And I think, you know, I just want to thank you for taking that time for being a part of you nope. your work with, with, with Faith to Faithless, how is that going? It, it, tremendously well. Um, we do, if you think of Northern Ireland as a case of, it's about take everything down by sort of 30 and you get the sort of size that we are compared to the rest of the mainland. But um, we have a population, our, our Muslim population is growing. It's a, probably officially it's about 10,000, unofficially it's probably about 15,000 people. Now that doesn't seem like a lot when you think of the whole the population of Northern Ireland is only 1.8 million. You know, there are cities and there are medium-sized cities and in, 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 in on the mainland that are bigger than that. But we have all the same problems. And then we have the big problem that no one talks about. We have the Christians who don't like the Christians over here yeah. and don't get on with each other. And we have that tribalism that goes at the root of it. So I even think beyond the immediate things of abusive uh, or controlling religions, you also have abusive and controlling sects that are pseudo-religious uh, that do pull people in, uh, and which we would, I personally would love to help people work their way through that. I'm not about taking people out of their faith system, but if someone is being hurt or abused, I want to help them, you know, find a better life. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to end it there. Um, so you've been listening to Jim Scott from Faith to Faithless in Northern Ireland. My name is Audrey Simmons. Thank you very much for, for watching and I hope you've enjoyed this session of Faith to Faithless in Conversation. Thank you. Ooh, just... Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to try and stop. <clears throat>